Welcome to the Solar Decathlon Building Science Education Series. My name is Paul Torsellini, and in this episode, we will be discussing the impact that buildings have on the electric grid. That complex system of generating and delivering electricity to consumers across the United States. We'll get into the details of the electrical power system and how it has been shaped largely by buildings. Finally, we'll talk about some of the modern challenges associated with increasing penetration of renewable energy on the power grid. Let's start by showing an example of a secondary school building in Boulder, Colorado. This graph is called a load profile and it shows the hour by hour electricity usage in this building over a handful of days. Specifically, we're looking at five weekdays in September. Notice how the building's electricity use ramps up during the daytime hours when the school is occupied. Then as the school day ends and people go home for the night, electricity use decreases to a pretty steady overnight base load of around 100 kilowatts. But it's important to note that not every building's load profile looks like this. In fact, this building's load profile would look different if we picked a different season, like winter, for example, where air conditioning wouldn't be used. Load profiles depend on various factors like the type of building and how it's used, the climate zone where it's located, and the energy sources used for heating and cooling the building. Typically though, buildings use less electricity at nighttime, but as the sun rises and the day begins, homes and businesses start to use electricity by turning on lights, making coffee, turning on computers, and so on. And as the day goes on, electricity use peaks usually in the afternoon, especially when air conditioning is needed and then it tails off for the evening as the various demands for electricity diminish. Digging a little deeper into this data, we see how various end-use load types stack up in this school to create that overall load profile. That overnight base load is mainly just some lighting and miscellaneous electrical equipment that runs while the building is unoccupied. During the day though, the building's electricity use is dominated by additional HVAC and lighting. Now imagine the impact of thousands of residential and commercial buildings demanding electricity from the power grid day after day. That's a pretty significant impact. In fact, as we introduced in our episode titled, The Impact of Buildings Using Energy, buildings are responsible for almost three quarters of the United States electricity consumption. This means that the fluctuations in electricity demand throughout each day and throughout the year are largely driven by buildings. And the power grid has been designed and built to serve the needs of these buildings. And that's precisely this impact. The enormous amount of electricity used in buildings and other sectors that the electricity grid has to supply with reliable power all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. One of the things that's interesting about the electrical grid is really how it has been shaped by this demand for electricity from the various end, use, end uses across the country. To put it simply, there are three main elements of the traditional power grid that help deliver electricity to the point where it is needed. First, electricity is generated at a power plant. Then transmission lines use high voltage alternating current to transport electricity over long distances from power plants to populated areas, known as load centers. You can think of transmission lines like multi-lane highways that allow large volumes of traffic to travel at higher speeds over long distances. Then the final step is the reduction from transmission voltage to lower voltage distribution lines that deliver electricity locally to its final destination. Using the same analogy as before, you can think of distribution lines like local streets that you would take to get to your house or office after getting off the highway. Scaling this example up to cover the entire country, the generation, transmission, and distribution of electricity is a complicated network rather than just one linear pathway from power plant to building. The complexity of the system is where we get the term grid. This snapshot from the US EIA mapping system shows high and medium voltage transmission lines, as well as substations throughout Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. It's easy to see how similar it looks to our network of roads and highways. 
The other thing that has shaped our power grid is the variety of power generation sources that we have available to us. Power plants are located where resources are readily available and transmission lines traverse the country to connect these generating stations to consumers. But also, this diversity of energy sources for electricity generation means that the exact mix of fuels supplying electricity varies depending on the time of day, the time of year, and the location where electricity is being consumed. It's always changing, which you can start to see on this chart here from the EIA. As demand for electricity fluctuates throughout each day, grid operators dispatch generation assets to meet that demand. These generation assets are grouped into three categories. Base load generation units, which supply part or all of the minimum or base load of the power grid. Intermediate load generating units, which respond to the load and vary their output up and down to meet the demand for electricity throughout the day. And finally, peak load generating units, which turn on when demand for electricity is at its highest and when it has exceeded the capacity of base load and intermediate load power plants. In general, these peaking plants are relatively inefficient and costly to operate, so they aren't called on most of the time, except for a few hours each year when they're needed. We'll end this episode by touching on some of the more modern challenges with the electrical grid in the United States. What we described in previous slides covers the more traditional architecture of the grid, where electricity flows outward from large centralized power plants to the point of consumption at buildings and industrial facilities. However, with more and more renewable energy generation being installed across the country, this is changing, and changing in two ways. First, renewables like solar and wind are intermittent sources, meaning that the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. So grid operators have little control over when those resources will be available to generate electricity. They're quite different from conventional coal or natural gas power plants that are dispatchable and can ramp their output up and down to follow the load. Without energy storage systems, the electricity generated by these intermittent renewables needs to be consumed right away, which has resulted in a growing trend of designing and controlling building loads to follow the availability of renewable power generation. By aligning load with renewable energy generation, we can better take advantage of these resources. An example of this is shifting certain loads to a different time of day, like setting the HVAC system to pre-cool the building in the early morning hours when there might be excess wind power being generated. The second way the grid is changing as a result of more renewable energy is the shift to a more bi-directional flow of electricity. All of the distributed generation or small power generation systems like rooftop solar has caused a lot of buildings to become power producers during certain times of the day. When a rooftop solar array is generating more electricity than the building is using at that time, the excess generally gets exported to the local power grid. The traditional model of power flowing in one direction from large power plants to loads is no longer totally accurate. Power flows to and from buildings now and utility companies and grid operators are adjusting to ensure that everyone still has a reliable supply of electricity at all times. We'll cover this in more detail in other episodes, but I also encourage you to check out the resources posted at the end of this episode for more information.